Okay, so I'm going to talk mostly about uh, power system stabilizers. Now, a little bit about oscillation, but mostly we covered oscillation. So I'm going to talk about power system stabilizers, and we'll do a hands-on where we actually tune a stabilizer. And you'll see that you can damp things out pretty well. Uh, we talked about oscillations. I went through that before. I showed that before. I showed that before. Um, I went through this fictional oscillation where the system was oscillating, so you know kind of what a oscillation looks like in terms of a, a visualization of it for the frequency. Uh, WCC definitely sees oscillations at various times, including forced oscillations. A forced oscillation is where something's forcing it, something's driving that oscillation. Uh, this slide gives a couple of examples of forced oscillations that have been uh, mentioned in the literature. Um, there are particular problem where you get resonance in a system. Resonance is possible when a system mode is poorly damped and, and closed. I give the example when my kids were little and I was talking about systems and oscillations to students, I'd say, you know, when you're pushing your kid on the swing, you're pushing at the natural frequency. You know, that swing's going to go at a certain rate, and you're just pushing it at that, that rate, so you're taking advantage of resonance there. Um, the WCC has some very well-known uh, modes. Uh, there's a paper there from 2012 that talks about some of the modes in the WCC. Uh, if you run a transient stability study, you should see these using what we talked about in uh, the last time I was talking about for uh, the GDVs and modal analysis, you can easily visualize those modes. Okay. This is one on resonance uh, with an area mode. Uh, the this is from Manny Venkata Supermanian from WSU. This is one on resonance uh, with an area mode. Uh, the, this is from Manny Venkata Supermanian from WSU. Uh, the resonance effect is high when you've got a forced oscillation frequency near a system mode frequency. Uh, the system mode is poorly damped and the forced oscillation location is near the two distant ends of the mode. This is where knowing the shape of the mode helps out and that's what we were visualizing. Okay, if you're, you know, in the Texas, we had that mode that went around in the circle. If you're in the middle of that circle, you're not going to be affecting the mode much. You're not going to be affecting that mode. Whereas if you're, you know, on the end, end of the mode, then you can affect it more. Okay. And that's a picture from a, a paper of a resonance occurring in the WCC control center. Yep. Okay, so that's a picture from a, a WCC presentation that was given. Did you get that, Dimitri? Somebody did. Okay. So. Yeah. There's a there's a, a tool that's used in the control center here to detect oscillations, and it just shows in different locations of the system whether the oscillation is between a hundredth of a hertz and 0 0.15 hertz, uh, 0.16 to 1 hertz, 1 hertz to 5, and 5 to 14. Okay, so then you can just see, the operators could see at a glance where the oscillations are. Okay, what we're going to talk mostly on this presentation is about power system stabilizers. The idea of a power system stabilizer is that you add a signal to the excitation system to improve the generator's damping. Add a signal to the excitation system to improve the generator's damping. And we went through the exciters on the first day, we saw where the, where the signal would come in. It's just a voltage signal, um, and the signal is then driven by some input. A common input is the generator speed. Another input might be the power or voltage or acceleration. They can also also be used. Usually you're measuring the signal locally from the shaft or somewhere right at the location, so it's a pretty simple control system in that regard. Uh, then you can use this to damp out either local modes or inner area modes, and you have to tune your PS, 
your power system stabilizers, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, is how to do that. Um, if you like looking at references, these are some references. <laughs> Going back to the diagram that we've shown throughout the course, we're talking about this part right here. So they're an input into the exciter. If we go to this diagram, what we're looking at is something that is putting an input into the exciter and it's sensing either the speed of the machine or perhaps it's sensing some uh, voltage or frequency coming off the network and using that as a control signal. This is the classic black diagram uh, it's from Kuhn's <coughs> book, and when I've talked about this in classes, usually I'll show this block diagram, and we go through an example where we calculate the K values, and nobody really follows what we're talking about that well, and um, teacher and students are all glad to be done with it. <laughs> teacher and students are all glad to be done with it. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to show you a different way to do it that's a little bit more fun, I think. Um, so this is, in, this is a block diagram of a power system. Uh, this is representing kind of the swing equation. There's the inertia of the machine and potential damping on it. Uh, there's the delta angle. Over here is the field current that's coming into the machine. So this represents the machine model that Jamie talked about in the field circuit. This is where the power system stabilizer is. This is where the exciter is. The challenge we have with stabilizer design is that what we're sensing is not in sync with what we can control. So, you know, it's like when, I, when I'm trying to damp a swing, if I stop pushing it or push in the opposite direction, I can cause that swing to, to stop with the, with the child in it. Here, there's some phase lag between the control signal we have here and what's going on here. So there's a delay in the system. And in an oscillatory sense, that's going to be a phase lag in the system. So what the power system stabilizer does is it's got leading compensation to compensate for that. And I've got some examples that you'll do for hands-on that will hopefully make this concept uh, more clear. But kind of to give a, a rough motivation, this is a swing equation that Jamie talked about on the first day. And it's saying, how does the machine accelerate and we've got the mechanical torque talked about on the first day. And it's saying, how does the machine accelerate? And we've got the mechanical torque minus the electrical power there. If I want to damp out an oscillation, I want to be injecting mechan or I want to be injecting a voltage into the exciter that ultimately produces a damping term here increases the damping on the system. We want to make it more damp. And if I could somehow modulate this terminal or internal voltage in such a way that it had a component that was proportional to delta omega, <coughs> with this simple model here, that's going to increase damping in the system. So what we're going to see is a hands-on kind of experimental way to do this and then I'll show you power system dynamics models. Okay, so the focus here is not to give a full course on stabilizers. I mean, I don't want to do that. I don't think any of you want that. Uh, but rather, we're going to focus on covering the basics and give you a feel for a simple design and hopefully when you look at a stabilizer in the future, you'll at least think, oh, I kind of know where those numbers come from. Okay, so we're going to be talking about different types of stabilizers. Uh, there's a number of common models for stabilizers. They tend to have similar features associated with them. Uh, this is an example, PSSS, it's the IEEE ST model. Uh, this is a single input one. 
it's got some filtering here which we're mostly going to ignore then it's got usually two blocks that are doing uh, phase compensation and usually you're putting in a leading compensation there you've got some gain associated with it you've got a washout filter and then usually there's some limits on it and I'll talk about this going forward um, this is a number another one uh, the PSSS 1A is very similar to the IEEE ST IEEE ST stabilizer and also another one called STAB1 uh, this has a measurement delay between what we're measuring uh, usually that T6 value is zero so you don't have any measurement zero so you don't have any measurement delay there's some gain there's a washout filter or two and we'll talk about those in just a second another filter which we'll mostly ignore then some uh, compensation which we'll talk about how to set the T1, T2, T3, T4 values there if you're into standards, IEEE 421.5 standard describes the common stabilizers. Um, the stabilizers that you tend to encounter in practice often have dual inputs. Here's an example of a dual input. One is a PSSS 2A stabilizer. You can bring in an input signal one. You can bring in an input signal two. Um, here's the phase compensation that we'll be talking about designing those values for. There is a gain value. Here are the washout filters that we'll be talking about. So this is just another view on it. The reason for the washout filters is because the power system stabilizers are associated with damping out oscillations. Um, they should be immune to slow changes. So washout filter, which I talked about earlier, washes out the low frequency stuff and just passes the high frequency. So it's a high pass filter. Um, another way to show a washout filter is if I look in a frequency space here of the gain on the filter, once the frequency gets high enough, the gain on the washout filter is one and then for lower frequencies it drops off with this slope here of uh, 20 dB per decade so it's attenuating the slow frequencies which is what we want it does add off with this slope here of uh, 20 dB per decade so it's attenuating the slow frequencies which is what we want it does add some phase shift but mostly that phase shift at the frequencies that we're interested in is pretty negligible so we don't have to worry about it so when you design a stabilizer what you're doing is you're picking a value for the T function that has a breakpoint frequency where you're saying what frequencies are so slow that I don't care about them a typical value for that is 5 10, something like that uh, what I did is I looked at the PSSS, PSS2A, which is the most common stabilizer in uh, the east and the west, and then I plotted the values of the uh, washout filter parameters, and this is the value. It's a little hard to see the number of devices in the model, bunch headed at 2, bunch headed at 4, bunch headed at 10. Same thing here, 2, 4, 10. So those are pretty common values to use okay now we get to the fun stuff and probably where most people will get kind of lost but then I'll show you how you actually do it um, if you're like a lot of engineers including myself you might not really understand these lead leg compensators I don't know if most people you understand yeah it's like we kind of know what they are but <laughs> so a lead leg compensator has this form where it's 1 plus ST1 plus 1 plus ST2 okay and S in in what we're talking about here you can think of it as J Omega where Omega is a frequency of interest okay at high frequency it looks like S over T1 divided by S over T2 so there's a gain there and the S drops out 
as we go up in frequency, the amount of phase compensation on this varies. <coughs> and it varies according to the scaling of T1 to T2. And with a power system stabilizer, we're, we're trying to inject a signal to damp out something that we're measuring. So we're measuring the frequency that's oscillating in a way we don't want to do it, and we're injecting a signal. But to inject that signal, we're measuring the frequency, but there's a lag between what we're injecting and the impact it would have on the frequency. So we have to compensate for that lag. So that is saying we need leading, a leading compensation. It's like we have to predict the future. And predicting the future is, you know, hard to do. The future. And predicting the future is, you know, hard to do. Unless you're dealing with the sinusoidal waveform, which is what we're trying to deal with here, if, if we're trying to damp out a sinusoidal waveform, we know what that waveform is going to do if we know its frequency. Okay, we can predict what it's going to do. So we can use this leading compensation to get ahead of the game and to act like we know the future. And that's what we're going to do. So if you look at the gain on one of these as a function of frequency, it goes, this is in dB, so uh, a <coughs> dB of one, of zero is one, this is one, then it goes up to some ratio of T1 over T2. Then it goes with the phase compensation, it goes up to some maximum. The maximum phase compensation, it goes up to some maximum. The maximum it can get to is going to be below 90 degrees. And then it goes back down to zero. What we want to do with our compensator is we want to design it so at a particular frequency we have a particular phase shift. And the equations for this in terms of relating the phase shift to an alpha value and a T1 value, which are what ultimately go into the gain here, all we need to know is what frequency do we want to damp out and how much phase shift do we want. So those are going to be the inputs. Well, the frequency we, we want to damp out, that we can get by looking at the system. Like let's say your system is oscillating at one, damp out the one hertz oscillation. You pick F as one. The tricky part is to know is how much phase lead do we add into the system. So um, in doing stabilizer design, we have to know the phase shift associated with known as uh, with what is known as the GEP. How much phase shift does that have? GEP stands for the generator excitation and power system. We need to compensate for the phase lag of the uh, GEP. So in a black diagram here, we are sensing, perhaps we're sensing the speed of the shaft. We go through our PSSS. That gives us the voltage that we're putting into the exciter. There's a delay of work is what we want to damp out. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to experimentally determine that phase angle. All right, so let's design this stabilizer to do something. Okay, so we're going to design this. We're going to ignore this part right there. And we're going to design T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, 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 T6, KS. Okay. The simple one is to ignore KS. I mean, I'm sorry, to ignore T6. So we're going to ignore that. So T6 is zero. So we got that. Um, the washout filter removes low frequencies. T5 is usually several seconds, so we'll average, say, 5. So we'll just say T5 is 5. Okay, so we're moving on our design here. We got T6, T6 done. We got T5 done. 
Okay, we ignore those guys, so we don't have T5 is 5. Okay, so we're moving on our design here. We got T6, T6 done, we got T5 done. Okay, we ignore those guys, so we don't have to worry about those. So we only have five, five to go. And the max min, usually those are about point 0.1, so we're okay there, we're like halfway done. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I said T5. <laughs> it doesn't matter much on what it is. Okay, so we're going to have to figure out KS, and we're going to have to figure out these values. Uh, what's commonly done is these are used to add the leading compensation. It's very common to have these two blocks be identical. So we're going to say T1 and T3 are the same, and T2 and T4 are the same. That's very common. So now we only really have to pick three. Okay, so what we're trying to do... Uh, I'm going to go through this fast because nobody likes to talk about eigenvalues, but we're trying to shift eigenvalues around. Do you like talking about eigenvalues? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like eigenvalues. Uh, no, Tom, I was just wondering why, uh, if we're, why did we show the two blocks, the two things, like phase um, uh, compensation blocks there? For your, These two? Yeah, why do, you, why do they insert two? Especially if we just go ahead and assume they're the same. Well, they're both adding a degree of shift. Okay. So the most we can get out of this is 90 degrees. Oh, so the most we can get out of that is 90 degrees. So they're both going to provide a shift. Okay. So, so they, need more than we need two of them to get more shift. Okay. So the values are identical, but the shift adds up. So yeah, if we want, say we want 50, to, we need two of them to get more shift. So the values are identical, but the shift adds up. So yeah, if we want, say we want 50 degrees, what we'll do is we'll get 25 degrees here, 25 degrees there. Now you could design it for 50 degrees here and zero degrees there. That, that's something that you can do as well. But we'll just make them equal to make it simple. Okay, so we talked about eigenvalues, we're moving eigenvalues around. Um, so we're going to uh, put in some enhanced damping at a desired frequency. And let's just jump ahead to an example here. Okay, so open the case WSCC 9 bus underscore start, and it's in the whatever talk this is, I think it's talk 11, in that directory, just open up that case. Okay, so I'm opening case, open case in I've got it in talk thirteen. What talk do you have? Okay. All right, so it's WSCC nine bus start. This is that little 9-bus system that Jamie was talking about. Um, go to add-on transient stability. And I'm running it for a fault where I put a, put a little fault at bus 8 on the system. Okay, so go ahead and run it. And there's our generator rotor angle. Is that well damp? See, uh, it seems like about 10 what? seconds it damps out. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, and it continues to go. It's not like it's continuing well, to oscillate or getting bigger. Well damped is in the eye of the beholder, okay? But let's say we think, think that's not good. well damped. Let's say you have a system like that, and you're like, yeah. I need to put a PSS in to damp that out. So let's do that. So here, here's the bus frequency like that. And I say, well, what what is the damping on that? What's the oscillatory frequency? The good thing is now you know how to quickly do this. So let's look at, um, we're going to look at the rotor angle. 
we're going to look at the rotor angle. Yeah, let's look at the rotor angle and calculate its damping. So everybody should know how to do that. You can go to re results from RAM, uh, uncheck all on the gen page, just look at the rotor angle, and then do that uh, right click modal analysis all columns, do the modal analysis. There's just three signals, so we can do the um, matrix pencil or iterative matrix pencil. They'd be the same in this case. Okay. You could also have gone over here and set your data sources from a plot and then looked at the rotor angle and, and that would work too. Okay. So this system has actually two modes in it that we're concerned about. There's a 1.36 hertz mode and there's a 1.36 hertz mode and there's a 2 hertz mode. Okay. Um, the damping on the 1.36 hertz is 4.97% and on the other one is 8%. So let's zero in on this one. We want to damp it out. Okay, we're going to tune our power system stabilizer to damp out the 1.36 frequency. Okay, so we've got our F now and we need to know what F do we want. So the F is 1.36 hertz. Okay, so <coughs> now what we're gonna do is we need to know the phase lag between putting the signal in to the exciter from the stabilizer and the actual change in the speed of the machine, which is gonna be our input signal. There's a lag there. And we need to know that phase lag because we need to compensate for it. Okay. Um, we added a little test signal. So if you were actually out in the field, you could put a test signal in and you could measure it and get the phase lag. So we're going to put in a test signal. Uh, we created a new object, a new stabilizer that just inserts a test signal. So if you open up the case WSCC 9 bus stab underscore test, and go to And go to bus 2. If you right click on bus 2 here, look at the generator information dialog and go to stability and go over to the stabilizer. There's a type that's called signal stab. Signal stab is a new stabilizer that I added for the first time we taught this class in fall of 2019, and I was figuring out how to teach this, I thought, I need a test signal. So it was very simple to add this one. It actually sort of looks like the uh, model that we have for the uh, signal generator that pulls the generator around. But this just puts in a voltage waveform, a sinusoidal voltage waveform. So all this stable at a specified frequency. And you do multiple durations, but we don't need that here. Okay, so make sure that thing is active. Should be active in your case. Click OK. Then go and run transient stability. When you run transient stability, in this case, you'll note that there's no event. I, I don't have an event set up here. The thing that's going to go on is that test signal is going to start oscillating up and down. And I plot some responses. So everybody got this? Okay. Go to the second plot, which is gen2 underscore stab design. And signal 
is our test signal. It's the uh, V stab. It's the input signal. So I start putting that signal in there. That gets the system moving. And the system gets moving. Uh, you get the, the voltage on the generator moving. You get the megawatt output moving. And you get the speed moving. Okay. And you can see that I put in the signal and stuff starts to go. And particularly the speed starts to get going and then it kind of gets into a steady state. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the phase angle difference between the speed, which is what we're trying to damp out, and our test signal, which is what our stabilizer is ultimately going to put out. Okay. So you might say, well, how do I measure the phase? But we're trying to damp out and our test signal, which is what our stabilizer is ultimately going to put out. Okay, so you might say, well, how do I measure the phase lag? Ruler. What? A ruler? Yeah, you could use <laughs> a ruler. That would be one way. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you had a ruler and we could even mark on here and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That way could work, but luckily now you know about the modal analysis tool. Oh. So you go to the modal analysis tool and you can go add-ons and then there's this little modal analysis tool. And here, if you select the input source as from the plot, I've defined a plot for Gen 2 underscore stab design there. That has the four signals in it. The ones I really need are my input signal and my speed. But I put the other ones in there just for fun. And in doing the modal analysis, I set the start time not to be zero. I wanted it to get oscillating and kind of move into steady state. So I just looked at it from five to 10. Everybody got that? Okay, so you see over here, we've got a 1.36 hertz mode that is pretty lightly damp. That's my forced oscillation that I'm putting in there. So of course it's lightly damp. That's what I'm forcing it at. So if you right click on that one and do show dialog, this shows the phase angle relationship between the signals that we're interested in. And what we're interested in is the input signal, which is V stab and the speed, which is what we're trying to damp. And what we're interested in is the input signal, which is V stab, and the speed, which is what we're trying to damp. And this one here is minus 160 degrees, and that's minus 81 degrees. Okay, it looks like the speed is leading the voltage, or the voltage is the voltage input is leading the speed by 270 degrees. We know the voltage input is leading the speed because it's driving the oscillation. So we just calculate the phase angle difference between these two right here. And I've got that on the slide here. So I don't have to do it in my head. Um, the difference here is minus 161 and minus 81 or whatever you guys get. Okay. That's telling us the, the phase angle across the, the GEP. That's what we want to compensate. But we don't want to compensate 280 degrees because if we compensated 280 degrees, we would be enhancing that oscillation. We want to damp it out, so we want to go 180 degrees out of phase with it. So we want to change this from 280, subtract off 180 degrees, and we want 100 degrees of phase compensation. Is everyone following this? John, this is why we have two of these. Because I can't get 100 degrees from one of them, but I can get 50 degrees from one. So I've got two, so that means I want each one to have 50 to have 50 degrees each. 
So now I go into my handy dandy little formulas here and I know how much phase shift I want at 1.36 hertz from each of my uh, blocks here. So I just work through this value, it gives me alpha, so I just take 1 minus sine of phi, phi is 50 degrees, and then I know my frequency 1.36 hertz, it gives me T1 and it gives me uh, T2. That's where those numbers come from. Okay, so now we've got T1, which is equal to T3, and T2 and T4, which are equal. We've assumed T6 is 0. I guess we said T5 to 10. We said A1, A2 to 10. We said A1, A2 to 0. The last step is we need to determine the value of Ks. This is done by finding the value of Ks that just causes instability and then setting the gain to about one-third of the value. Kind of a handy-dandy formula here. So if you go into the case, um, open the case, stab, WSCC underscore nine bus underscore stab. And if you go to bus two, and look at the stabilizer, I entered all this stuff into you for the stabilizer. I entered all this stuff into you for the stabilizer. The this is a um, TSSS 1A model. The IS ICS is the input signal. If you set that to one, it says use the frequency, the speed of the machine as the input. Uh, these are the filters we're ignoring. There's T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6. There's KS. There's the limit. Usually a max limit on the voltage is something like 0.1. A, min a minimum is like minus 0.1. Change the gain to be 59. And then run it. If you look at it, you should get that. Y'all get that? What we need to tune it is we need to know the value of chaos that causes instability, that just causes oscillations. And I, by trial and error, figured out it was about 59, 58, something like that. Okay. Now something magic will occur. Set that to one third of that. So like 19. I'm gonna try 57 first just to prove it to myself. Mm -hmm. Wait, try 57. I'm going to try 19. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you prove it to yourself. There you go. <laughs> now I'm barely damped. Great. 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 What do you think? <laughs> Works this much better. Take it out just to make sure I didn't do some sleight of hand. Is a great <laughs> if you go and you take out the stabilizer, so I'm going to disable it just so those of us who are skeptical know, hopefully it oscillates quite before. There it is. It kind of works like magic, doesn't it? 
So that's without the stabilizer. And then when I put the stabilizer back in, there's our signal. If you do modal analysis, I don't even know if we're going to see that mode anymore. Um, so it's going to do results from RAM, rotor angle. seeing the 1.36 it's like trying to break it up into <coughs> two frequencies because it's so heavily damped now it's like damped at like 20 percent so we're not even seeing it with the tool okay now you do still have that two hertz mode and you could go to another generator and tune a stabilizer to damp that laser to damp that mode there too so tell me if you've got multiple modes that you're trying to damp down, do you have to, is it like different settings or multiple of these stabilizers in each machine or do you have to go to different places or how, how would you do that? Uh, that gets beyond what I do, but <laughs> yeah, I mean it would be, I, I mean this is setting the stage for doing that. and. I, I will say that a single stabilizer, we're tuning it for a particular frequency, and we tuned ours right at that frequency. If we're saying, hey, there's two frequencies we're interested in, we could tune it midway between there and get some damping on both of them. Okay. Um, and this just did one generator in the system. So you could do it at another generator. This is where the art of this comes in. And if I did this for a living, I could tell you more, but I'm not going to just that yet exists. It almost seems like you could come up with some module that would calculate all the things that you could be doing to kind of put the optimal stabilizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, th this is something where, you know, um, this is more a teaching thing and just trying to demystify it a little bit for you guys. And it demystified it for me because before I had been teaching this class prior to like let's say a few hours before that class, I was like, how do I do this? Um, and when it when it worked, and it didn't always work on the first try for me, but when it worked, it's like, oh my gosh, that like really damped it out. It's like, wow, this design stuff actually works. So would you look and see which are the biggest players for each mode if you were trying to tune it on the system? And well, then right. That's where this stuff would come in and say, okay, which generators are most affected by that mm -hmm. mode? You know, like the visual stuff would come in and say, okay, which generators are most affected by that mm -hmm. mode? You know, like the visualization we had, uh, if, if I have that circular mode, I'm not going to use a generator in the middle to tune that circular mode. Okay. Pick a few big ones around the. But yeah, you look at some big ones around, <coughs> and I I won't dwell on on this because I think I've given it enough to do it. But I'll I'll show you in the slides where I went on this next. <coughs> so I I did that one. Uh, then I then I tuned uh, generator three. I, I tuned it. I think at the same at the same mode. I could have picked a different frequency. I did the one point three six. I could have did generator three at the other frequency. Maybe that would have been a better thing to do. Um, four degrees. So I worked through the data and got these values here. Um, when we were talking about auto correction on values, Dimitri was saying, hey, you know, be careful when you're auto correcting these stabilizer values. Because if I willy nilly go, hey, well, 0 0.062, that's too little, I'm going to change that. I'm changing my phase compensation. So i uh, got to be careful on that sort of stuff. Okay. When they're act when when stabilizer stabilizers are being tuned, do they you employ the same test signal to get the the uh, phase difference? 
Dimitri, do you know what they actually do? Does anybody know what they do? could play in different frequencies and you're going to get different phase lead lags at different frequencies too. So they're literally trying to be in all of them. So then I was feeling really good about this and I thought, hey, I'll do this on my 42 bus case. So I opened up this case 42 bus underscore PSS and you can open that one up. And I think under add-ons, I'm going to make sure all the stabilizers are tuned or turned off. So I'm going to go to models and use and make sure they're all off. So if you run transient stability on this, I've got it set up for a fault to do something. Uh, it, it, it's again a line fault. So you look at this system and you say, is this system well tuned? And you'd, you'd probably say, no, not that well tuned. So well, where we would go is what we did before. We'd go to add-ons, modal analysis. I'd, I'd pick an input here, plot. I'd do modal analysis. And I'd say, hey, I've got a a 0.95 hertz mode and I've got a 0.6 hertz mode. The 0.6 hertz mode is damped at two, a 0.95 hertz mode and I've got a 0.6 hertz mode. The 0.6 hertz mode is damped at 2.58%, which is pretty low. So I'm, I'm going to handle that one. So I'm going to go after the 0.6 hertz mode. I won't go through all the gory details here, but um, I give some of it here. Um, I, I picked the Lion 345kV bus, which I thought was the biggest bus, and then after I'd done it, I realized it wasn't the biggest bus, but it was pretty big. And I, I did not do the modal analysis to find out which ones participate the most. Um, so let's just look at that and see how Lion does. So there's Lion. Oh, there's a lot about the same. There's a lot of them. Yeah, they're pretty much all about the same. It looks like this mode is mostly everybody swinging against the Prairie 345 kV generator. So probably Prairie 345 would have been a good place to go, but I didn't do that. Um, actually, that probably would have been a good place to go. Uh, but I didn't do that. Where is Prairie 345? So that's this middle one swinging against everybody else. And uh, always the winter. Why? Well, it 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 is. Why? It's always the winter. Well, it 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 is a wind turbine. So honestly, if I had thought about this, keep in mind this was done in haste. If I had thought about it, I would have tried to put a PSS on the wind turbine, but I don't know if that would have worked that well. But anyways, I put one on Lion. Okay. And I go through the calculations here. I did the same thing. I looked at the phase compensation needed. I needed 19 degrees or 9.5 per lead leg. I did all my scaling and stuff. 
uh, it increased the damping to 4.24. The issue is I've got all the generators swinging against that guy, so if I put a stabilizer on one, I can only do so much. But then I said, hey, I'll put it on more, so I started putting it on more, and um, I gradually 0.16%. How many stabilizers can an individual generator have? Like how many modes can you go after? Uh, ultimately, there, there's, there's, you can go after multiple modes, but you're tuning it. You know, you do have dual input stabilizers, but ultimately you're sending a signal into the exciter at the machine. So there's only one input signal. But it can have frequencies on top of itself. Yeah, Super yeah, you can do, and that's where the dual input exciter or stabilizers come in. Like I said, this is just an introduction as to like get your your appetites, you know, what on on doing this sort of stuff. Okay, so here here's a job for the motivated student. Uh, given that you guys aren't students, but I have students, this is what I give to my motivated students. Um, We've been looking at that 2000. We've been looking at that 2000 bus case, and finish up with this. This case has stabilizers in it. If you go to case info, generator model, or models in use, you will see it has stabilizers. It's got IEEE ST stabilizers. If you right click and show dialog, on um, those are the parameters for the stabilizers. Talking about uh, I guess it's a little bit different, but it's pretty similar. They're all the same, and they're not particularly well tuned. I there. would say the fact that they're all the same is they're not tuned at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the guy that did this was my postdoc, and he tragically died. Right. He died in September of 2018 which was after he had done this, uh, we were talking about modifying it. And we, we need to tune this case. And I'm like, how do I tune this case? Yeah, like a herd of grad students. I mean, I think this approach would work, but there's like a lot of... Um, when you say tune, I'm not sure it follows the definition. There's like a lot of... Um, when you say tune, I'm not sure it follows the definition. So. Let's say I decide. What? Let's say I decide I'm going to use IEEE ST stabilizers. <coughs> Here they are, and the damping on this case is not that bad. So he did something that is not that bad, um, but it's not tuned. The tuning would be to say, how do I set all these parameters? I know the process to go through and set some of them, and we can do it one by one by one, and in essence tune it. And I'd have to say, okay, how many of these do we really need? We probably don't need a stabilizer at every generator. You know, so we'll look and we'll say, here's some large generators, we'll put stabilizers in there. It's a good exercise, you know, and it could be that I say to my students, hey, now you know how to tune one, there's only like, you know, 150 in here. I mean, you, you showed basically the algorithm that you're yeah. after, right? Yeah, I mean, could I showed... You, could you, could you mm -hmm. do that on a spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. Copy mm -hmm. all that data mm -hmm. out? Sure. Well, right Calculate now, it, it's getting the phase, the phase lag <coughs> between the, the two, and then it's experimental where you determine the cave where it just starts to oscillate. Yeah. See, on the real grid, I mean, you know, it's the real grid, and we pay people to go out and tune the stabilizers at the generators, and that's a good thing to do. You know, you got a yeah. thousand megawatt generator, it's worth so spending a few hours tuning it. You have a thousand megawatt fictitious generator, 
And you know, this has 65 gigawatts of load on it, and so it's like we've got 80 gig of generators, you know. Oh. If you're starting from scratch, you just turn them all off and see the response and go after the biggest modes with the biggest generator that plays? Well, yeah, and that, that would be, so, you know. Oh. If you're starting from scratch, you just turn them all off and see the response and go after the biggest modes with the biggest generator that plays? Well, yeah, and that, that would be, so let, let's just do that here. Um, so we, we did this, you know, for modal analysis. I'll, I'll be done then, Jamie, and who's taking over after me? We'll probably go to a break. But, yeah, we'll do a break. Um, let me just do that real fast, and I'm going to run it for 15 seconds. And the good thing about the 2000 bus case is it does run fast. Okay, and you, you look at that response, and you could say, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like damp. Sort of. This is with all of them off? You no, they're all on right now. Oh, all on, okay. Okay, so we we did the. I mean, this this is the case that we worked through. We did modal analysis on it, and then go that way. Um, this is the bus frequencies. I think I already ran it, and the. You now this is just doing ten bus frequencies. <laughs> Let's do all of them. Bus frequency. All here to matrix pencil, do it. <coughs> okay, so the worst mode we have is the 0.6 hertz mode, and it's damped at 6.7%. And then we've got a, a close to 1 hertz mode that's damped at 8.7%. So I mean, 7%. And then we've got a, a close to one hertz mode that's damped at 8.7%. So I mean, what what's a good damping for WCC? Yeah, 10 plus. So we're not that far off. Let's tune. Up, let's turn them all off and redo it. So if you go to uh, add-on transient stability case info models in use, you see the IEEE ST. I'm going to right click on that, show dialog. I'm going to toggle these all inactive. So if I go to the active, right click, I can do toggle, set all, not active. So they're all off. Okay, then I go and run it again add ons, transient stability. Is it already up in another window? Um, oh, no. Nope. <laughs> right, so what, what my guy did, did something. I mean, so I, I'm going to do modal analysis on that. Obviously, it's going to be negatively damped. Like I've got a negative uh, damp 0.52, 0.47, one hertz. Uh, there's a lot of negative damping going on. So what the the guy's name was T. What T did was good by setting them all equal. I don't know what he did. Nobody knows exactly why those came out that way, but. It, it's not individually tuned, but yet you can't say it's not doing something. I mean, it's certainly doing a lot, so I don't know. 
They weren't all the same. Like some of the ones I noticed, T1 was not set equal to T2. Like some of the T1s were 10 and right, T2. Right, but all the values were the same. Almost. Like if you look at Odessa, it's T1 and T2 are vastly different. Odessa. T1 and T2, yeah. Oh, those ones there. If T1 is zero, what does that mean? Does that mean it's out? Uh, this, these are IEEE ST1 or ST stabilizers, and I don't know the parameters, but we got them in the slides here. Yeah. yeah. T1 and T2, T10 and T2 is something. 